Hello and welcome to the Southeast Rivers Trust series of webinars, The Story of Rivers. The Southeast Rivers Trust is a grassroots environmental organisation dedicated to bringing rivers back to life across the southeast of England. This is episode six in our series, it's all about fish passage. So part one is going to be hosted by Chris today, and that's going to look at fish migration and some of the problems with in-river barriers. And part two, which will be posted later in the week, will be hosted by Toby and we'll look at some of the solutions that we put in place to overcome these barriers. So if you have any questions at any point during the webinar or afterwards, uh, please feel free to ask them in the Facebook comments below um, and we'll try and put together a question and answer session um, or do smaller, more in-depth episodes um, about specific topics soon. Now I'm going to hand over to Chris, who's going to be your main presenter for this webinar. Uh, hi there, uh, my name is Chris Gardner and I'm the catchment manager at the South East Rivers Trust. Uh, I work with uh, sort of numerous catchment partnerships across our area, uh, identifying uh, potential projects to address specific issues that affect the ecology of our rivers. Um, and my background is as a fishery scientist specialising in the spatial ecology of freshwater fish. And today I'm going to be talking about fish passage. OK, so I'm just going to talk about uh, what we're going to cover today. Uh, we're going to be talking about fish passage. Uh, so fish passage, fish passage. Uh, it's, it's a bit of a tongue twister, isn't it? Um, but what does it actually mean? So we're going to break it down into those two parts, really, the fish part uh, and the passage part. So the fish part, uh, we're going to talk about uh, fish and fish migration. And then in the passage part, we're going to talk about river connectivity. Uh, and then river connectivity is to do with the access to uh, certain habitats for fish. And so we're going to talk a little bit about what those specialised habitats are and give some examples so you can see uh, why fish need to move around their catchments. And then specifically, uh, we're then going to talk about barriers to fish migration. So these are the in-channel, in-river structures like weirs and locks and things uh, that separate fish uh, from those habitats. And we're just going to talk a little bit about the specific impacts that barriers cause as well as breaking river connectivity they also have um, other impacts as well so this is part one and uh, my colleague toby is going to talk in part two about some of the work that we've done to um, address fish passage issues in our patch okay so firstly the fish part uh, we're going to be talking about fish and fish migration so here's a fish marvellous aren't they i mean fish are great fish are absolutely awesome creatures uh, and they live in all of our rivers all over the world and because they live in water you know fish spend a lot of time swimming i mean you thought michael phelps swam a lot well that's just peanuts to fish you know fish swim all the time pretty much and they're very highly adapted to swimming they have very highly streamlined bodies and for a river fish they need to swim constantly just to maintain a static position so you have to hand it to them you know fish have got huge potential to be highly mobile animals migratory fish so this is a term that you may have heard um, and it implies that there are non-migratory fish if there are migratory fish um, but it's really a little bit out of date i suppose uh, and in the last few decades we've come to um, understand that uh, all freshwater fish migrate uh, to a certain extent um, however these sort of traditional uh, migratory fish that are sort of been well their migrations have been well known uh, for a long time they do they are pretty spectacular migrations, which is why um, you know, humans have been aware of them for so long uh, and therefore called them uh, migratory fish. So here's two examples. Uh, on the left, we've got a, a salmon uh, and salmon migrate from UK rivers to feeding grounds off Greenland and Iceland, which is uh, pretty far away. Uh, and on the right, and then they return, return to UK rivers to spawn as well. So it's a, it's a two way journey. Uh, and then on the right, we've got a, a large silver eel, which is just about to migrate uh, uh, all the way across the Atlantic to the Sargasso Sea in the Caribbean to spawn. The juveniles of the eel uh, then have to swim all the way back across the Atlantic to populate our rivers, uh, which is again a, a pretty spectacular um, journey. And I suppose this term migratory fish is a bit of a hangover from uh, the last piece of fisheries legislation, the Salmon and Freshwater Fisheries Act, uh, which specifically calls some fish migratory uh, and others but this dates back to 1975 so it's uh it's you know it's 45 years old so knowledge has come on our, our understanding has improved since then all freshwater fish migrate uh, and all fish have life stage specific habitat requirements and therefore need to move around between specific habitats habitats to grow uh, and there's now a wealth of scientific literature that backs this up uh, and some of this is list listed on the slide uh, to the left but this is by no means an exhaustive list i suppose um, 
But these sort of within river freshwater migrations of these fish, fish uh, can be quite subtle uh, and hard to detect. Now, obviously, fish live beneath the water surface uh, and therefore difficult to observe. So until recently, these migrations have pretty much remained unknown. However, in recent years, with the development of modern telemetry techniques, uh, that's tracking fish with radio, acoustic and passive tags, uh, these techniques have revealed these behaviours and our understanding about the spatial ecology of these uh, fish species has hugely increased over the last few years. So these studies have demonstrated that adult fish use different habitats at different times of the year and therefore require free passage between them uh, in order to, uh, to do so. Uh, habitat requirements can be species specific, so a bream spawns in a different habitat to a chub and are different for adult and juvenile fish uh, and they also um, can differ between seasons and also between day and night. Uh, so during its life, a fish has to use many different habitats um, to fulfill its, its life history and a healthy, diverse fish population can only be uh, supported by a wide variety of these habitats. Okay, I'm just gonna give a couple of slides now about the work I did during my PhD, tracking common bream on the river with them, just to give a, a bit of a case study about how fish move around our river catchments. Uh, so that's a bream on the right hand side there, there's me releasing one of my tagged bream into the River Witham and you can see that in the background the River Witham is quite a large lowland river, river system and the bream themselves they're quite um, uh, you know a reasonable sized fish, uh, this one's probably about five or six pounds um, and bream are a lowland species and that means that they're found in these sort of large deep slow moving downstream sections of the river just before it sort of enters the sea. Um, my study was between Bardney Lock and Boston uh, on the River Witham in Lincolnshire and that was quite a large uh, area, uh, it was like 40 kilometres of main river with no barriers between it, uh, obviously there was a lock at Boston which is the tidal limit and a lock at Bardney Lock at the top end, um, so they were the barriers that sort of delineated uh, the section, but there were also a number of tributaries that joined, so we had 40 kilometres of main river and then about 40 kilometres of tributaries, so there's a very large area really. Um, that the fish could access. Um, so it was a big, big open study area. Um, and I was able to track bream for four years through that study, uh, through that study area. So we were able to see sort of repeated seasonal behaviours. Um, over the four years, I tracked 83 uh, adults with implanted uh, acoustic tags. And I did that um, by using fixed receiver stations. So I wasn't out following the fish every day. That would have been really labour intensive and really difficult to do. Uh, but modern technology, um, at the time had just come on the market where you could have sort of fixed receiver, receiver stations every couple of kilometres along the river and they recorded the, the presence uh, of uh, the tagged fish when they were within range of that receiver. Okay, um, so from all of that data, uh, we had about 20 receivers and about 80 fish. We generated a huge data set, 3.1 million fish detections, um, and we were able to, you know, analyze their behavior I suppose and so first of all we uh, we looked at the um, uh, that how far that they'd moved uh, in each month uh, and this graph here uh, shows the mean distance moved by the bream in each month of the study uh, along the bottom of the graph you've got the the months uh, and the distance is up the left hand uh, axis and uh, we've also got the water temperature on the right hand axis so you can see that uh, uh, when that lot that black line peaks that's during the summer months when water temperatures are at the highest and obviously as fish are uh, cold-blooded their um, activity levels were very much um, correlated with the water temperature as you can see there uh, during the summertime um, when the water temperature were were, were at their peak, um, the fish were most active. And you can see that on average, you know, fish were moving 30, 40 kilometers a month. You know, I had one fish that moved um, nearly 120 kilometers in a month. So that's a huge distance and just shows how uh, active and mobile fish can be. Um, so um, I just want to talk a little bit about how the fish were distributed through the um, uh, through the study and again we saw this repeated sort of seasonal pattern where they were spread out through the whole river during the summer and then they became very aggregated um, up at the upstream end during the winter so there was definitely that sort of again that seasonal behavior um, that we saw repeated year on year um, and then a little bit about the habitat use um, so we had sort of uh, classified the habitat obviously the river with them is, is a big fen drain it's very uniform very homogeneous habitat but there were three distinct 
habitat type. So there was the main river channel, there were shallow tributaries, and then there was one deeper tributary. And we found that the fish were, um, during the spring, uh, they found a lot uh, that they spent a lot of time in the shallow tributaries. Obviously, this, this water is warmer, um, and so fish seek out warmer water. They're cold blooded, uh, and their metabolism is very much dependent on the temperature of the water. So, if there's a bit of the river that warms up the quickest in the springtime, they want to get in there. And also, um, they'll also use these shallow um, um, side channels for uh, tributaries for spawning. Um, and then in the winter months, when they were aggregated up at the uh, upstream end of the um, uh, study area, they were utilising the Sinsel Dyke, which is a much deeper tributary. Um, so they were basically getting out of the main river flow and seeking shelter in that uh, deeper, deeper side tributary. OK, so we've covered the fish part of fish passage. We're now going to cover the passage part of fish passage. Uh, so what is passage? Uh, basically, we're talking about river connectivity. Uh, and river connectivity comes in two forms. There is longitudinal connectivity. So this is uh, up and downstream, uh, as we sort of traditionally know it. And there is lateral connectivity. And that is the connectivity between the river, its floodplain and any tributaries that are coming into it. Um, and both of those are really important. So connectivity um, is at the catchment scale, which is obviously the natural state, and this allows all species to access the habitats that they require to complete their life history and gives the greatest variety of habitats um, so that fish have the best possible choice uh, for their requirements um, and therefore can maximise the chances of their survival and success. Obviously, fish evolved in open connected rivers, and that is what they're adapted to, and so that is um, uh, what, what we're basically uh, looking to restore. So um, obviously completely connected um, catchments is the natural state. Um, however, humans have modified uh, rivers for our own use and habitats have become separated by in-river structures like weirs and dams that block fish passage because obviously fish can't swim through um, a concrete wall. Uh, and some of these weirs may be huge great structures like uh, in the top right there, uh, you've got uh, a great big sluice uh, from uh, central Wales, or there could be just tiny, tiny little weirs like the one on the top left there. Um, but both of those, both of those structures will block the passage of certain fish species. Um, so basically, these in-river structures sort of break connectivity, and they cause uh, what we call habitat fragmentation, uh, which is the disruption of con of continuity of habitats used by wildlife. It's a terrestrial wildlife problem as well as an aquatic one. Um, obviously, habitats that were once well connected, um, we've built towns and weirs and all these things uh, that are separating habitats into sort of separate fragments. And this separates individual animals from specialised and essential resources or habitats that re they require to complete their life cycle um, or survive. Um, so this is quite a big problem. Um, uh, for the rivers uh, in England. Um, all rivers in England, uh, due to the Industrial Revolution and basically the physical modification of rivers for milling and navigation and things like that, plus more modern modifications for water abstraction, land drainage, flood defence, etc., um, have all um, caused lots and lots of these barriers and weirs and things to be built in the rivers. Um, for example, uh, in the centre map of this uh, slide is the uh, East Kent, uh, Kentish Stour catchment and just as an example in in that catchment there are 141 known barriers so there's 141 barriers to fish migration that are in that data set and that are known uh, but these data sets are you know quite often seriously incomplete and therefore underestimate the amount of barriers. Um, there was a recent study done by Jones uh, who ground truth these data sets by walking along the river and just seeing you know exactly how true it was um, and he found that um, there was basically 97% of the river network in Great Britain is fragmented and the mean barrier free length of river in England was just five kilometres. Uh, so this is a specifically a big issue for the rivers of the southeast of England due to the level of urbanisation and the length of time of human settlement in this area. So different species uh, have different swimming and jumping capabilities, and so they are impacted differently. Uh, there's a couple of pictures of the species which are best adapted to cope with uh, in-river structures like weirs. On the left, we've got juvenile eels, uh, which are able to climb wetted vertical surfaces. 
Um, and on the right hand side, we've got uh, a large salmon jumping into a jumping a weir, or it's actually jumping into a fish pass here. But due to the uh, uh, the extreme drought that was going on at the time, uh, it, the fish pass wasn't. Um, operating as well as it could be and it was forming a small weir but uh, the salmon was still able to jump into it. Um, obviously these species are the traditional migratory species and so you know they undergo these uh, huge migrations to and from the ocean and so it should come as no surprise really that these are the species that are best adapted uh, to be able to cope with uh, in river barriers because they've developed that skill set because they do have those uh, you know that behavior of these huge migrations however other species like coarse fish such as chub, barwell, roach, bream and dace they are very very they're not so well adapted to to jumping and climbing and things like that and so the impact of these man-made structures uh, can be greater on these uh, traditional um, uh, sort of just freshwater species I suppose. Okay so we've talked about fish and we've talked about passage and why fish need to move around their catchments to find specialised habitats. So what are these specialised habitats? Uh, so I'm just going to say a few words and give a few examples now about some of the specialised habitats that uh, uh, fish need access to at certain times. Okay, so um, refuge, uh, cover basically. Obviously fish um, are a very um, popular prey species by other fish and birds and mammals. Um, and so during the daytime, when they when they can be visible to these predators, they need to find refuge and cover. Um, so in this picture here, we've got lots of roach. They're all sitting underneath a, a boat mooring, um, all taking refuge under there. They can sit in the shadow of the boat mooring and uh, remain hidden from predators. Um, a bit more natural um, refuge. Uh, here are some big carp that are sort of sitting in the fallen branches of sunken trees. Again, nice safe refuge area for them, safe from predators, and they can sit in the sun there and warm up. Um, lateral habitat. So these are the backwaters, the tributaries, the floodplain water bodies. Um, these are specialised habitats that all fish species um, can utilise at certain times. This photograph, I don't know if you can make it out, but there are basically millions of fish uh, all squeezed into this uh, little backwater here. This uh, photo was taken um, on the River Neen near Peterborough and the main river was in flood at the time and all these small fish had gone into this little backwater to uh, seek refuge from the main flow uh, that may have washed them away downstream. Um, again, another sort of lateral habitat are these really shallow um, uh, marginal areas um, and they're really important for juvenile fish, juvenile coarse fish, uh, juvenile salmonids. Obviously they're only one, one two centimetres uh, in length, um, the, 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 these fry, and they can't swim faster than the current in the main river so they need to still seek shelter and refuge from that main flow uh, so they don't get washed away. Um, and they also seek out these really shallow marginal areas, so these shallow marginal areas they uh, they warm up really quickly in the sun you know the temperature of this little um, sort of puddle here can be five or ten centimeters warmer than the main river that it's connected to and this can really lead to accelerated growth obviously fish are cold-blooded animals their metabolism is very much dependent on the temperature of the water around them um, and so by getting into these really shallow warm water areas they can speed up their metabolism metabolism, digest their food and grow quicker. And obviously the quicker you can grow, the quicker that you can fight the main current and uh, evade predators and stuff because uh, as, a, as a one to two centimetre fish you're, you're quite a vulnerable little animal. Um, and also in these really shallow areas they're also safe from sort of water-based predators, you know, a, a pike or a perch isn't going to be able to swim into two or three centimetres of water um, and so it's a nice safe area from predators as well. Okay, um, another lateral habitat. Uh, this is uh, an oxbow lake. Uh, there's there's, a, there's a, a trout here, quite well camouflaged. You can probably spot its shadow, um, but its main body is quite well well camouflaged against the um, sort of mud and algae of this oxbow lake. Um, again, you know, adult fish go into these um, areas for foraging, and again, they'll seek refuge uh, when the river is in flood. Um, another lateral habitat. This is um, one of the side channels from the river. Uh, with them where I did my PhD um, and the bream use these as we discussed they use these as spawning areas during the spring so uh, the male bream would get into the, the tributaries uh, first and they would um, sort of guard marginal spawning areas um, and defend them against other males and they'd all have their own little territories and uh, wait for the females to come in. 
Uh, gravel riffles are really important for fish spawning, uh, both salmonids and um, some coarse fish. Uh, so this photograph is a large sea trout uh, in a new forest stream and it's sitting on a red. You might be able to see that there's a, in the centre of the picture there's a, there's a cleaner area of gravel. Well that is, that is a nest where the fish has laid its, uh, its eggs. And if you just look at the upstream end of that cleaner patch of gravel, you should be able to see like a dark, a little dark straight shape and that's a, that's a large sea trout sitting on that red. So that, that sea trout has just spawned there uh, and they tend to sit on their, their reds for a few hours after they've spawned and uh, you know, recover from the, the rigorals of uh, spawning uh, before they move off. Um, but obviously salmonids, you know, they lay their eggs uh, in the winter uh, and they have a, a very long incubation period of a few, few months where their eggs are buried in the gravel. Uh, and so they need to bury them in the gravel to protect them through that time period. Uh, but it's not just salmonids that spawn on gravel riffles. Here's some barbel uh, spawning in the river ooze. Um, Barbel and chub uh, and dace, they all spawn on gravel in the summer. Um, but obviously the water temperature is a lot warmer in the summer and so they don't need to bury their eggs, they just lay their eggs on the gravel because they just ha they hatch in a few days rather than a few months. Okay, so barriers to fish migration. Um, so these barriers can separate the fish from the habitat, these habitats that they need. Uh, and these structures, um, have three main impacts really. Um, there's the habitat fragmentation issue that we've discussed briefly, um, there's a habitat degradation issue and there's also um, a sediment transport impact um, which I'll go into in the next few slides. Um, however we do need a bit of a balanced view uh, on this because you know weirs do bring many benefits to society uh, both aesthetic and amenity value as well as facilitating human services like abstraction, navigation, power generation and weir pools themselves, um, you know, the pool that forms at the downstream end of a weir um, are a really important habitat for fish, you know, great deep water, turbulent surface, they provide uh, a great sort of daytime refuge. And again, the impounded reach above a weir, although that uh, habitat is degraded from its natural state, it does uh, support habitat for, um, you know, large, um, adult fishes, uh, roach and bream and things like that. Um, and so they do have an intrinsic value uh, for recreational fishermen. Okay, so habitat fragmentation, we've touched on a little bit um, and we've already seen that our rivers are fragmented into on average sort of five kilometer sections. And so the different species of fish have different habitat requirements for different purposes. So fish can only use the habitats that are available to them in the section of river that they are restricted to. So instead of having the whole catchment, uh, which is often hundreds of kilometres, uh, they're just restricted to just a few kilometres. Uh, so if any one habitat type is lacking uh, or limiting or inaccessible, uh, there will be consequences for the individual's survival and therefore the population as a whole. Uh, so in river structures like weirs, locks, sluices, they restrict the variety and quality of habitats available to fishes. Um, habitat fragmentation also places um, populations at risk. Um, obviously they can't avoid um, incidents like say a pollution incident. Uh, it can also affect the genetic diversity of animals. Um, obviously um, instead of having the whole river um, of um, individual fish from your specific species to breed with, you're restricted to just a few that are trapped in your section. And also these barriers prevent recolonization. So obviously if you do have a, an incident, um, a drought or a, a pollution incident where some fish um, are killed, usually fish would be able to repopulate, uh, recolonize that area naturally just by swimming upstream or downstream, but with lots of weirs uh, that, that can be prevented. Okay, so weirs and sluices, they also um, cause habitat degradation. So obviously a weir and a sluice, weir or a sluice, they create what we call an impounded reach upstream of the structure, uh, where basically, you know, a free flowing river habitat becomes a lake like habitat. Uh, so on the left hand side, you can see there's a gravel riffle and a free flowing um, natural river system. And on the right hand side, there's a big sluice, uh, which causes the water to back up behind the sluice uh, or the weir. And therefore that takes all of the energy out of that water. And uh, instead of it being a free flowing, um, you know, dynamic river habitat, it just becomes a great big pond. And this drowns out natural features like riffles. Um, so, you know, we've seen how riffles are used by fish for spawning and the reason fish spawn on riffles is because there's lots of oxygenated water there for their eggs. But if you imagine 
uh, putting in a great big weir, you drown out that, that riffle, there's no speed of water over that riffle, um, it's just a great big pond and lake and therefore it doesn't uh, have the same oxygenating um, capacity uh, and therefore degrades uh, that as a spawning habitat. The third main impact of uh, weirs and in-channel structures is the impact on sediment transport. So rivers are naturally dynamic systems with erosion and deposition occurring in balance and riverbed sediments are in constant motion flowing downstream. So it's not just the water that flows down a river, but the gravel on the riverbed uh, flows downstream as well. Um, it's a bit slower. Um, but this geomorphological activity, as we call it, this is really important for building and maintaining habitats. So sediment gravel is shaped and sorted by this water flow and creates a large diversity of habitats. So sediment transport is halted by weirs, which reduces the supply of gravel to the downstream reach, uh, which can uh, affect the quality and quantity of the habitats in that downstream reach. In recent years, these issues have become quite well understood, uh, spawning an international dam removal movement. Uh, this, um, this movement have been campaigning for the restoration of river connectivity by pushing for the removal of existing redundant structures and dams and through campaigning for the prevention of building new such structures. The promotion of these issues uh, has also been facilitated through an International Fish Migration Day, uh, which has really had a really quite high profile and is really bringing these um, these issues to the forefront now and uh, really educating people um, about the about these issues and uh, the need for restoring connectivity to rivers. Um, OK, that's all for part one. Um, in part two, my colleague Toby is going to be talking about some of the um, interventions that we've done to facilitate fish passage uh, on the rivers through the southeast. Thank you. That's great. Thanks, Chris. Uh, please remember to type your questions below if you have any. Uh, this will help shape future webinars and can also um, mean that we can do some Q&A sessions later on. Next time is Fish Passage Part 2, as I already mentioned. It's going to be Toby talking about some of the solutions that we've put in place um, to overcome barriers to fish migration. That's going to be posted later this week. So I hope you've enjoyed this episode of The Story of Rivers and we'll see you again soon.